Thank you, Peter, and good morning. Um, so just to, just to recap, I'm going to, on the pro, uh, to say that recalls are not terribly effective, saying it rather in the positive rather than the negative. Um, before I start actually giving my arguments, and I'll actually make four points to, to support my position, uh, I'm going to stipulate right up front that recalls are an essential component of a food safety plan. No question about that, and there's no argument for me anyway on that point. But after that, there's a big but. And the but is, in my case, point one, is that uh, a couple of different problems with recalls. And one of the reasons I think that they're not a terribly effective tool or not one of our top tools is that in many cases, if not most cases, recalls are only initiated after many, and in some cases, most of the cases have already occurred. And in the case of, for instance, with the spinach outbreak uh, back in uh, 2006, we, were, we at FDA were heavily criticized for making a public health announcement uh, when after the fact it was found out that all the cases were already done. So it was, you know, an effort to try to protect public health, but it wasn't really effective at the time at preventing any or very few. And this just shows some data by CDC, and I'll have a couple here, that shows a, an epi curve uh, with the red line showing when the recalls and is announced. In this case, you've got months and months and months of uh, cases before there is the uh, recall. And so this is not all uncommon, uh, and there's a couple reasons for these. And you'll find this most often uh, in the cases of uh, products that perhaps are more shelf-stable than, than less. But there's good reasons for this, and one of the reasons why this is not going to change uh, anytime soon without further technology is also another CDC document showing the fact that why it is. And that is it just takes so long to identify uh, the cases, to identify it, and, it, and actually point to the uh, contributing food or food ingredient that at best um, you're going to have at least a week or perhaps two weeks delay before the recall is ever uh, initiated and probably longer than that. So that is point one. It's just you're always going to have this baseline uh, majority of cases before the recall is initiated. The second part is that recalls are rarely 100 percent effective at removing the product from the market, uh, just even from grocery stores. Uh, in some cases I've heard um, uh, percentages as low as only 30% effective at removing it off the shelves. Now again, that depends on if it is a shelf-stable product that may be around for a long, long time, as opposed to something like a perishable produce, something like that where either it has been consumed by the time the recall occurs or it's spoiled and it's not available for removal uh, by itself. Uh, a good example of this was uh, back again, uh, the Castleberry uh, botulism recall. When that was done, uh, the, both regulatory agencies, state and federal, were frustrated by the fact that nobody was paying any attention to the recall. Um, so we had, uh, in fact, I personally had gone out into some rural Georgia to look in stores and found cans uh, on the shelves days after the recall. No one had even bothered to look at this. And this is something with, where you're talking about a, a deadly disease. And I'll talk a little bit about why that might be in a moment. Point three is that recalls are reactive rather than preventive, which is the current philosophy in food safety. You don't want to wait till the problem happens. You want to deal with it ahead of time. Recalls are an admission. It's an indictment that effective food safety tools were not implemented properly in the very beginning. And secondly, that effective food safety tools are really, if you want to be effective, you have to prevent, not react to uh, failures within, this, within the system. And probably one of the most compelling reasons that I came up with is that consumers often ignore recalls. And in fact, uh, the Grocery Manufacturers Association uh, uh, contracted uh, with Rutgers to do a study to look at human behavior, consumer behavior during recalls, and found some pretty shocking results, which is the fact that while most consumers think that, think that recalls are a good thing, they want to hear about them, only about half of them think that it will affect them and so consequently, they don't even look for recalled products on their own kitchen shelves. Second to that is when they do, they don't often believe that uh, those products uh, are contaminated or adulterated uh, according to the recall. And even that, that being said, over 10% were identified as saying uh, that they consume it even if it was recalled. So to let that sink in, 
this is contaminated, don't eat it. And they say, nah, it, you know, forget it. it, it's not gonna happen to me. And so maybe there's not too much you can do about people like that, but the, the point is, is that this should not be a primary food safety tool for the general public because many will ignore. And then there's also the point that uh, there's a, an interesting uh, paper that was uh, published by, by CDC offers F FDA as well as some state officials looking back at the Salmonella Tennessee uh, outbreak with peanut butter. And the point they made as they went through the whole scenario was even after the uh, recall had been initiated, the number of cases uh, took months and months and months to return to the baseline. And well, why is this? Well, again, it's this point that many of the consumers in that case continued to eat the recalled peanut butter that was in their house, even though they knew that it was part of the recall. So this brings me back to the very first slide that I started off with, which is, yes, recalls are important. CDC, or at least the authors of this paper, agree, but then said that they are, uh, although they're often necessary and effective public health measures, they are imperfect tools for controlling the safety of the food. In fact, they are a rather blunt instrument where one should be using the better techniques, the preferred techniques, up front to prevent the, the uh, outbreak in the first place or contamination. So that is all I have for that, so I can stay on time. Okay, good, mo good morning. Um, so I am going to, just to be clear, I'm going to be arguing that recalls are an effective tool in the food safety toolbox. Um, and I wanted to just start out because I figured Bob and I would agree on several points. Um, I think we can all agree that food safety is a shared responsibility. Um, I also think that we can all agree that food business operators should only be allowed to market safe food. And the government is responsible along with um, others in the food safety uh, system for protecting consumers from health risks. And food safety risk management systems should focus on uh, prevention. That said, we all know that systems fail, okay, and they, they are not perfect and failures would occur. And unsafe sh food probably, sh sh not probably, should be removed from commerce as quickly as possible. So I think we can all agree on those statements. Um, so the question is, are they an effective tool? Well, just in 2012, um, FAO and WHO issued a report on establishing and implementing national food recall systems. And in there, they say that food, food recalls are a fundamental tool in the management of risks in response to food safety events and emergencies because they provide a framework for removing unsafe food from commerce. And they minimize the impact of these system failures on public health the individual company, and the entire business sector. And finally, it maintains confidence in the food supply. So I'm going to look at an example also from CDC. So this is the 2009 peanut butter outbreak. Um, it's a very busy slide, but hopefully you can see the arrows I've established in red. The first arrow, um, which was, this was January 10th, is when PCA initiated its first recall. And the second arrow is when uh, they expanded their recall. And th I, the reason I'm looking at the one on the bottom is because of the, um, this is a date of illness onset. And you, this is the epidemic curve. And you can see that, yes, we still continue to have illnesses, but it drops off significantly after the recall. And if recalls are effective, you would see most of the cases go away. That's what we would want to see. Um, now, what is the alternative to recalls? And I had actually debated just getting up here saying two words and then sitting down. Foster farms. <laughs> but I decided you probably wanted more than that. Um, so foster farms, I'm sure everybody in this room is aware, you know, there's been an ongoing outbreak. From March 1st, 2013, we've had over 621 illnesses in 29 states in Puerto Rico with a 36% hospitalization rate. And uh, these we're dealing with antibiotic resistant strains of salmonella. In June 27, 2013, CDC ident first identified the illness cluster and uh, matched the PFGE to a NARM sample. 
On July 1st, 2013, FSIS identified the NARM sample as Foster Farms brand chicken. And on August 9th, 2013, Foster Farms was informed of the outbreak link. It wasn't until July 3rd of this year that Foster Farms recalled the product, um, and even then it was a limited recall. Now, what this means is from the time, from uh, August 9th, 2013, to this time, we've had over 340 illnesses. So let's look at the epidemic curve here. Here's when the illness cluster was identified. Here's when the, um, it was matched to the, uh, identified as Foster Farms. Here's when Foster Farms was actually informed of the outbreak link. And what would have happened if Foster Farms had initiated a recall at this time point rather than over at this time point? So from a public health perspective, we could have potentially uh, eliminate, uh, avoided all of these illnesses. So what are the cons to recalls? Um, first of all, they are costly to implement and resolve. Uh, so let's just look at the numbers here. Uh, Listeria, a single case of Listeria monocytogenes, and yes, I picked a, a rather big number, but I uh, wanted to make a point, uh, is estimated to cost $1.28 million, according to the SHARF estimates. Food recall is estimated um, to cost $10 million to the company. But of course, illness is averted in the lifelong impact, and including damage to the brand, the company, the food sector, and the confidence in the uh, food supply is priceless. Um, the other argument I've heard, I've read about that is a con to recalls is, well, it just generates new product liability cases. Well, um, this may be true, but this is one of the biggest uh, deterrents we have in our food safety system, right or wrong, at this point in time. The theory is, is that uh, companies don't want to be sued, so therefore they're going to produce safer products. So this goes, um, and I will also mention that this is usually the only recourse, even though it's highly unlikely that a victim will ever uh, actually end up having uh, litigation solved. Um, the, the third point that uh, is often offered, and, and Bob uh, uh, mentioned it, is uh, recall c fatigue and consumers are going to just stop listening because they're tired. Um, well, consumers have a right to know what they're eating. Also, uh, I would argue that Yes, recalls are effective, we're just not communicating them very well. So that's a different issue. And then very little product is recovered. And I rarely see a, a recall notice that says, please return all of the product to the store. Typically it says, throw it out. So our recall recovery system really is not designed to recover product, it's designed to destroy it. Um, finally, and I don't know how much I am on time, one minute, okay. So in this recent FAO report, uh, FAO WHO report, they identified the key, essential key components for an effective food recall system. And it says that there should be provisions in the recall system for food business offer operators to have recall, food recall plans in place and that they should be tested regularly. regularly. Uh, food business operators should have traceability systems in place, one step forward, one step back. Food recall op uh, business operators should be required to notify government when suspected food is uns when they suspect food is unsafe. And finally, the uh, recall system should have provisions for exemptions for those selling direct to consumer. For on the government side, um, it said that a food recall system should have uh, give the government the authority to enforce recalls when needed, because this turns an implicit uh, threat into a real threat. And finally, food business operators and government should inform consumers adequately about health hazards of specific unsafe foods. And I would argue our health, our recall system is missing several of these key components. So the bottom line is food safety is a serious public health issue. It is, I, the ideal is to focus on prevention, but all systems fail and we do need to have a way to remove unsafe food quickly and effectively from commerce. Recalls provide a framework for protecting pub the public from unsafe food, but the problem here, I also agree with uh, Bob's but, the problem really isn't recalls, it's the implementation of our recall system. And that's because there are several key components of an effective recall system that are missing from the current system in the United States. Finally, food recall systems can be effect an effective tool in food safety if developed and implemented properly. Thank you.
Okay, time for my three-minute rebuttal. Um, so I, I think Barbara and I both agree, public health is important. The whole idea is to try to keep as few uh, individuals becoming ill as possible. However, the, the, the statement was that recalls are an effective, are an effective uh, tool in the toolbox. And Barbara's last comment again made my point, which is they are not now because there's so many flaws in the recall system, including communications in, and um, perhaps having recalls that may not be necessary, may, may, may not be for public health reasons. So I sort of look at recalls as absolutely essential and the but again, and since, since Rob Tokes used the car uh, metaphor, I'll use car metaphor as well. Um, using the example of airbags, I think everybody or most people absolutely want airbags in their car, and it's an important part of the car. But almost nobody, and my friend Sean Kennedy can attest to this, wants the thing to go off. You don't want the crash. You don't want to ever have to use it. So the preventive controls in the case of the car is not drunk driving, making sure the car's maintained, uh, having other preventive uh, instruments on the car, such as uh, anti-lock brakes, a lot of other things. Uh, the, the recall and the airbag are plan B for when plan A fails. Okay, so I guess this is on. So um, I would argue, I would agree with Bob that, that implementation is important, but if we look at the original statement, food recalls are an effective tool in the toolbox. It, it, you know, it doesn't say necessarily that, um, it doesn't say the current food safety, food, food recall system is an effective tool, which I would have had a hard time agreeing with. Um, we do need plan Bs, and it is one of many tools in the toolbox that we need, but you always need a plan B, and it has been effective in getting product off the shelves and protecting public health. There is a lot we could do to improve our recall system, um, but it is absolutely essential that um, we have that plan B. Okay, um, we are actually spending your coffee break right now, but uh, since you're still here, I think we should uh, allow time for a couple of questions. So in, in my case, uh, the airbag was triggered because the trigger was a deer. What should the trigger be for a recall? Well, if it's a deer, uh, a deer could be actually a recall for food recall too. It's in FDA's jurisdiction as, as game meat. <laughs> so if, if there's a, a foodborne hazard and it's a, there are commercial venison uh, manufacturers, one could do that. But no, it actually should be if there's a, a, a threat to human health. That's really the, the, the goal of a recall, not to try to avoid litigation. Right, and I would argue that um, a threat to human health uh, is preventative. We are getting food off the, pr uh, off the shelves. Not only that, we learn a lot from recalls that inform future interventions and prevention systems. Uh, hello, my name is Sid Camp. Uh, both of your examples dealt with outbreaks where uh, you had an epidemic in progress, the horse was already out of the barn, systems had failed. But most food recalls from a, manufa from a manufacturer's perspective occur when nobody has been harmed yet. Most recalls are preventive in nature. And would either of you care to comment on that? I guess I would make the distinction between a recall, a public recall, and a market withdrawal where it's always been under the company's control to begin with. I would agree that uh, that happens an awful lot for a lot of different reasons. It's when you start involving the public and, and public communications that, that the recalls perhaps, when there is somebody actually being harmed, where they should do the most good, but they're reactive and the company has already failed. And again, I would argue that it's preventive. It, it is reactive at the same time preventive because you're preventing additional illnesses from, from occurring. And uh, so therefore, it is important. I mean, one of the challenges, and anybody in public health knows this, the hardest thing to measure is prevention because you don't, you can't count the number of illnesses that you truly prevented. So it makes it very difficult to, to measure that and that's one of the challenges. But we have averted a large number of illnesses through many recalls and uh, the, the challenge is how to quantify that. One final question, comment. 
One of the largest causes of recalls is allergens, which impact specific people who have an issue with that particular allergen issue. Are recalls the best way to protect that particular population, or might, might there be other ways that would be more impactful that wouldn't be removing product from the marketplace that would not harm other people? Well, obviously, the preferred um, tool to use is proper labeling and, and segregation of the ingredients so that it, there isn't a, 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 a recall because of uh, allergens. But that, that said, that's the, ne that's the only other thing you have is to notify them, and it does two things. They, they can avoid the product um, and then get it off the, the shelves so that others who may not bother to read the recalls, of which there are many, uh, are also not exposed. So I, I, I don't really work in allergens, but as the mother of several children who have food allergies, um, you know, I, th I think that it is important. It can be life-threatening. Um, and, you know, when my daughter was younger, a taste of cheese would, was a trip to the hospital. Um, but I think that, as Bob said, it's the only thing we have right now. And one of the challenges that we have is how to better communicate recalls to the public so that they take them seriously. And that's, I think, one of the biggest challenges we have is to, to how do we communicate that in a way that they, uh, that they understand, truly understand the risk and are making informed choices and get the information out there. 